This episode contains discussion of rape, murder via bludgeoning, kidnapping, fraud, BDSM, consensual and forced, mentions of suicide, mental and physical abuse, and general lion sack type stuff. Listener discretion is advised. John Edward Robinson is a con man, grifter, embezzler, kidnapper, and murderer. For decades, Robinson ran schemes or flat out stole from his employers for monetary gain, but eventually escalated to murder. He would use classified ads to attract victims, but once the internet became commonplace in American homes, Robinson used it to find victims. Because of this, the media often refers to Robinson as the internet's first serial killer. Oh man. I know. Um, you guys know the drill. Before we get started, we have some thank yous to do. Yes, we do. Um, did we ever figure out, are you the Tory that requested this? I don't know if we did, no. Okay, well, there is a Tory. Yes, and I don't know if it's a me Tory or a you Tory, so. <laughs> yeah, so if you're the Tory that requested it, thank you. And if you're the Tory that requested it, thank you're you. Uh, also, Amber McKinney and Emily Herman. Thank you for requesting thank you. this, and thank you to Mark for writing this up. Thank you, thank you. We love you. So instead of starting with Robinson, a.k.a. the douche canoe, uh, today we're going to start out by talking a little bit about John Robinson's known victims. So, I mean, you guys know how it is with serial killers. Um, you don't necessarily get as much information about each victim, unfortunately. Um, and it, it kind of really becomes more about the killer, um, in psychology and how and why and all these things. Uh, but we did want to talk about his victims first. Um, there is more information out there about some of these women compared to others, but we'll go over what we know about each, uh, in chronological order of when they met Robinson. Paula Godfrey was born on June 19, 1965. She graduated from Olathe North High School in 1983. During her early life and teenage years, Paula loved to figure skate and is often said to have been a fairly accomplished amateur skater. That's incredible. Yeah, I can't even do it. Like, I, I barely can figure skate figure skate i can't barely <laughs> cannot figure skate not l even a little bit but i definitely have a hard time just on an ice skating rink yeah a hundred percent i have there's one picture of me ice skating for the first time well two pictures in the first picture i'm like oh, happy and then i lose my balance and so the second picture is me going <laughs> like that it's like a very unflattering picture but that's pretty much uh my ability so, yes, that yeah. was the beginning and end of your figure skating career. Exactly. All in just, yeah, one moment there. <laughs> Paula had a petite frame with brown hair and eyes. After she graduated high school, Paula was presented with an opportunity to join a company, Equi2. She was interested in starting a career in business, and this seemed like a perfect fit. She was told she would fly down to San Antonio, Texas for a clerical skills course, and that's something that wasn't uncommon back then. Now, you'd be like, that doesn't sound right, probably, but then you had to go on site, obviously, to do training. She told her family goodbye, and she excitedly set out with John Robinson, the man who hired her, and Paula's family never saw her again. Lisa Stassi was born in April of 1965 in Huntsville, Alabama. When she was 18, she became pregnant, and she and the father got married and relocated from Alabama to the Kansas City area after their daughter Tiffany was born. After arriving in Kansas City, though, the marriage suffered and eventually failed resulting in Lisa and her daughter turning to various organizations for assistance in the area. One such organization was Hope House, that's a shelter for uh, women experiencing homelessness in Kansas City. While there, she was approached by a man calling himself John Osborne, who claimed to work with the Kansas City Outreach Program, and they specifically assisted young mothers. We'll get more into that a little bit later, but after joining Osborne, Lisa and Tiffany both went missing, and eventually Tiffany would be found again, but more on that later. Catherine Frances Clampett was born in May of 1960 in Korea. 
She was adopted by an American couple and grew up in Texas. In January of 1987, Catherine left her child in Wichita Falls, Texas with family, and she went to the Kansas City area to stay with her brother and his family to try to find a job and start a career to provide for her family. And she applied for a job at Equi 2. Oh, sounds familiar. Right. Are we seeing a pattern? In 1987, John Robinson went to prison, but put a pin in that. While in prison, he met 49-year-old Beverly Bonner, which was the pr prison librarian. While he was incarcerated, he was given a job in the library and served as Beverly's assistant. So the two became friends, but they actually knew each other already. Like, 20 years before this, they had worked together uh, somewhere in Kansas City. And then after his release, Robinson employed Bonner at one of his businesses. Her family never heard from her again, except for typed letters with her signature. And that's, um, that's not going to be the first or last time you hear about something like that. So Exactly. Sheila Faith was born in February of 1949 in Texas. She had a teenage daughter named Debbie who was born in November of 1978. So Debbie was born with spina bifida and spina bifida is a type of neural tube defect. It can happen anywhere along the spine if the neural tube does not close all the way. When the neural tube doesn't close all the way, the backbone that protects the spinal cord doesn't form and then close as it should. This often results in damage to the spinal cord and nerves. So Debbie was wheelchair bound, but everyone who talked to her, including her doctors, believed that she would absolutely be able to walk eventually, if nothing else, just because of her attitude, determination, and positive outlook. Sheila would go on online and use chat rooms, which were gaining huge popularity and attention. Remember, this is many years ago now. Uh, so chat rooms are just kind of getting big. And online, she met a man who lived in Kansas City, and she moved there with Debbie to be with him. I find this part of it to be really, really interesting. First of all, I think that Debbie is an inspiration. I think that her positive outlook and her attitude, because attitude, I feel like, can be everything for whatever trials and tribulations you're going through. And for her to be born with spina bifida and still be so positive and so determined, like, that's amazing. Absolutely. I also, side note, um, something different for Sheila to cuz I have I've been in in the dating game here and there um it's not gone well but anyway um I live in an area and if somebody if they're like let's say 50 miles away I'm like next no too far she relocated all the way to Kansas City like that's crazy Right. To me, I mean, no shade against anybody who does it, but it's like, that's a big move. Exactly. Yeah. She obviously felt very connected to this person, Trusting. trusted this person. Right. And we'll talk about that more too. But again, it just really goes to show you that there are people who are incredibly charming who you know it's like that when we covered John Wayne Gacy when the the guy who had been friends with him or whatever said his mom said well whoever told you evil was ugly True. now John Robinson is not attractive but not he, even a little bit see and that's the thing too and I feel awful he pulled so much ass for lack the, I don't mean to be crass or well uh, we are crass and vulgar but Mm -hmm. Um, nothing against the victims, but I just don't, I don't get it. Like, obviously he was very charismatic, very manipulative and very, yes. very, um, swoony. I don't know the right word for it, but charismatic is probably the best word for it. But look, just looking at his photo and I know too much too, but I'm Not like, sure. in what world? How? Yeah. And also like, if you just look at his photo he just looks like a regular dude, right? So he doesn't, I mean, obviously, you know, if you follow true crime, you know that typically serial killers don't look like serial killers. I mean, no. you know, there's, there's certain kind of aspects that we've come to associate with serial killers, namely the serial killer um, glasses, glasses from like the 70s me. or whatever. The spectacles, sure. Exactly. But you look at a picture of this guy and he looks like, you know, the guy that you see at the 
uh, chamber of commerce or, you know, the guy that manages the bank or whatever. I was like, going to say the bank. Yes, really. exactly. I really he looks was. like a bank manager. Yeah, he totally yeah. does. Like, so and he's it's got just, the glasses too, so. He definitely does, yes. So he just, you know, it's for her to pick up and move like that. She yeah. saw something in him and and that's what he does best though. Like, mm-hmm. it, you know, I think a lot of people in life can say that they've been manipulated by another person or, you know, kind of tricked by another person and stuff like that. And I think the tendency is to blame yourself. Like I should have seen this or I can't believe I fell for that or whatever. But these are people that that's what they do and they're good at it. They've honed their ability to take advantage of caring people. Yes, they have spent. And that's the thing too. I think that if anything, it should make you feel better about yourself as a person because they see right. something in you that is like the shimmery diamond that they want for themselves. Now, do they deserve it? No. Should they do it? No. But it should. you should never, if you can, I know it's not easy because I think we've all been there, but it's it's not your fault. Right. Exactly. It's just, you know, it's what they do. And like you said, it they're looking for somebody who is compassionate, caring, all of those things. Yeah. Trusting, loving, absolutely, yeah. Isabella Lewicka was born in April of 1978 in Poland. Her family immigrated to the U.S. and then settled in Indiana. Isabella graduated from Harrison High School in West Lafayette, Indiana in 1996 and then went on to attend Purdue University. She was a talented artist and she even painted a wall-sized mural at Purdue. That's amazing. That is amazing. Like, how many artists can say that they've done a full, like, mural at a university campus? Like, that's a big deal. Well, and here we go. I mean, this is one of the uh, one of the great things about talking about the victims like this, because they should be recognized. We should talk about them. Look at all of the accolades and all of the amazing qualities that all of these women possessed. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's just so unfair. Yes, it totally is. When she was a sophomore in college, she began an online BDSM relationship with John Robinson, who convinced her to relocate from Indiana to Kansas City. And once she got there, he bought her an engagement ring. They filled out all the forms for a marriage license, which she assumed had been filed because why wouldn't you? And then her family never heard from her again. Suzette Troughton was born in April of 1972. There's not much information regarding her life before she met JR, as he called himself online when he talked to her. She was experienced and familiar with the BDSM lifestyle, particularly the Gorean practices. This branch of BDSM is based on a series of books written by John Norman, and it's a sci-fi series about an adventurer in a primitive world similar to Earth. Throughout his adventures, the main protagonist encounters many women who he forms this like master-slave relationship with, which is the basis for the Gorean concept of master and slave in bdsm so it's kind of like the hobbit exactly like the hobbit okay yeah all right oh it's like the hobbit (laughs) which uh rachel said it was rachel Rachel says that that. yes it's (laughs) about uh be your own windkeeper be your own windkeeper rachel oh yeah yeah oh rachel so norman's gore series faced severe criticism and disdain from several groups particularly feminist which made publishing the series difficult but people still managed to find the books and it developed kind of like a cult following. So Suzette eventually moved from Michigan to Kansas City to be with JR and then was never seen by her family again. However, they did receive typed letters with her signature at the bottom. All I can think of when I hear typed letters with her signature at the bottom is Jim Jones. That's it. 100%. Hundred percent. I know. Somebody asks you to sign a bunch of blank pages. Run away. Don't run away. do it. Run the other direction. Yeah. There, I cannot think of one thing that somebody who loves you and has your best interest at heart would ever need to have you sign a blank paper and it's good. It's a good thing, you know? Yeah. Like, I can't think of any reason why that would happen. No. 
because if it's a contract, you'd be able to read it first. If it's uh, anything, you should be able to read it first. Like, it's just ridiculous. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to do it, but we're going to talk about him. John Robinson was born in December of 1943 to Henry and Alberta Robinson. He is the middle child with four siblings, Henry Jr., Donald, Joanne, and Mary Ellen. The family called Cicero, Illinois home, and in 20... mm -mm, Whoa. Whoa. In 2023, I'm like, this is like The Hobbit. Now we're... That's now! I know. 19. In 1923... Chicago elected William Emmett Deaver as mayor, which led Al Capone to move his Chicago-based organization to Cicero to avoid the reach of the authorities in Chicago. So once they set up in the suburb, Capone and his gang quickly seized power over the local saloons and rum-running business, and the Chicago Outfit, as Capone's organization was called, operated out of Cicero for several years. While John was growing up, Henry Robinson worked as a machinist for Western Electric, and this is a 9-to-5 job, and Robinson said that his father was hardworking and law-abiding, but he was also a heavy drinker. Some accounts said that Henry was also abusive towards his family. Alberta Robinson was the disciplinarian of the family, and she ran a tight ship when it came to the household. We've talked, of course, the McDonald triad. That's not something that is brand new. Um, I know that mommy issues... Well, par- parental issues, I think, are just probably a big part of it. But I'm thinking of so many, specifically, I don't know if you, Ed Gein, he's, he wasn't really a serial killer, but he, he is billed as one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He had a lot of mom issues. Like, there, that's common for a mom to be really strict and really the big disciplinarian. Yeah. I'm thinking Ed Kemper. That yes. was like a major one where his mom was just as tough as nails i mean yes and it's i mean there there are so many i'm sure but it's i'm seeing the i know too much but i'm seeing the red flags obviously many on the outside said that alberta was tough on her children but she also pushed them in positive directions she wanted them to excel in life and said that began with being clean and well dressed and she encouraged them to better themselves robinson described his mother as quote unquote detached when he spoke of her later in life but alberta saw john as her child with the most potential as a young boy henry encouraged john to join the boy scouts and john thrived in the organization In the Scouts, Robinson worked hard and was able to attain the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest rank one can achieve in the Scouts. I feel terrible. I used to cut hair. I knew this kid that was an Eagle Scout. I did not give him the um, amazement. I don't know. I I was like, oh, cool. Eagle Scout, cool. I didn't realize how hard it was. I feel awful. And he's like, "Um, I have worked my ass off for this. Is this thing on? I'm 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 an Eagle Scout. And I'm like, hello. Yeah. Good for you, dude. Yeah. Oh, great. Good to hear. I, I, when he wasn't a bragger, so he didn't tell me like how big of a deal that was, but I was like, cool, man, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I don't think he would be watching or listening, but if he is, I'm sorry about that. And that's amazing. Yeah. And if that's not a true hero, then I don't know what is. Because attaining the rank of Eagle Scout is something that less than 5% of Scouts have achieved since the organization's inception in 1911. And for several decades, being an Eagle Scout would give you a leg up in certain situations. On job applications or college applications, seeing that someone was an Eagle Scout meant that they were trustworthy, they were dependable. It was something that people put a lot of weight into. To obtain the rank, a Scout has to perform various tasks and earn at least 21 merit badges, 14 of which have to come from a list of Eagle required merit badges. The other seven can be any of the 138 offered by the scouts. This process is estimated to take a scout four to six years to complete, but some have done it in a much quicker time frame. One task that takes a while, though, is that the scout has to perform an extensive service project that they have to plan, they have to organize, lead, and manage. The projects must benefit an organization other than the scouts, cannot be performed for an individual business or be commercial in nature. This is a huge undertaking, obviously, but the rank of Eagle Scout has lost some of its luster in recent years because of there have been controversies that have surrounded the Scouts over the years. Also, like, aren't, I don't know, I associate, like, the Eagle Scout rank with, like, I could ask my husband this, he's an Eagle Scout, but when do they do that? I feel like this is, like, you're young you're very young i mean you're obviously in your early teens maybe well the the kid that i i call him a kid the kid that i knew that was working on his eagle scout 
he was doing his service project, whatever. Um, he was uh, rebuilding a park mm. and um, trying to take out a lot of the the vegetation. Like, um, uh, what do you call that? Oh my gosh, what is the word? The um, ah, the plant life that comes in and, like chokes out other plant life, and yeah. they are not native to this area. They were trying to clean that out. Yeah. Um, and they he did great, and he he got it, but he was. 16? 15? Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's a lot for a child that age to, you're talking about organizing, planning, leading, managing. These are, Mm -hmm. you know, like, it's just so, such a waste of so much effort and talent. In training. And yeah, I mean, he had a lot of potential to, and how many times? I mean, like, there are so many times where we talked about it where it's like, if you just went the other way, think of how much better the world would be exactly. if you just channeled all of that into something, mm-hmm. I don't know, even half as great as you could be, you know? like Exactly. Like, we could probably have a cure for cancer or something. Just come mm-hmm. on. Right. Ugh. As an Eagle Scout, Robinson was chosen to lead 120 Boy Scouts in England at the Royal Command Performance in London. They performed in front of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, also performing at this event was Judy Garland. Hey! I know. While backstage, Robinson ran into Judy, where the two spoke briefly, and even though Robinson is clearly at a young age, he wasn't shy. What were the chances that he would ever see Judy Garland? backstage or anywhere, right? Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So he took that opportunity to try to make an impression. While they're backstage, he gave her a smile. He did a little, a little wink. And uh, then he said, we Americans got to stick together. And Judy Garland thought it was funny. So she laughed, she gave him a kiss. Um, and the incident gave him a bit of a minor celebrity back home. Sure, everybody's gonna be like, that's the guy that Judy Garland gave a kiss to. Yes. Like, that's huge. <laughs> that's bold, though, to be a kid and see a friggin' now... Celebrity? <laughs> and Judy Garland, I know maybe some people don't know who that is, right? But she was a very famous actress, but dancer, singer, all of the things. I mean, God, The Wizard of Oz, obviously, but, like, Meet Me in St. Yeah. Louis. Like, all she... Oh, my gosh. It was just amazing. Mm-hmm. And for him to have the cojones to do it is pretty amazing. Yeah. In 1957, Robinson enrolled in the Quigley Preparatory Seminary in the heart of sh- downtown Chicago. I almost said Shantown. <laughs> Shy town. Quigley was a five-year academy for Catholic boys, and Robinson had said repeatedly that he wanted to become a priest and eventually work in the Vatican. Didn't happen. Now, what he, where he started versus where he, that doesn't, I didn't see it coming. Um, no, no. That's like, that's a 180 if I ever saw one. Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, after about a year at Quigley, Robinson dropped out and seems to have switched to public school. Records show that he wasn't exactly the best student. He failed multiple times. He got into fights with his classmates. Much of his time was spent in detention, but eventually he did graduate. In 1961, he enrolled in Morton Junior College in Cicero. He studied to become a medical radiographer, but he dropped out after two years. At some point between high school and college to make extra money, Robinson began doing quote-unquote favors for some of the local crime families. This seems to have mostly been like running money or items for local bookies, which he was able to do to make some quick money. But also what it showed him was that it was possible for him to make decent cash by doing some shady shit. In 1964, Robinson married Nancy Jo Lynch, and in 1965 they had their first child, John Jr. Then daughter Kimberly came in 1967, followed by twins, Christopher and Christine, in 1971. Their family would also relocate from the Chicago area to Kansas City during this time. Okay, so now we're going to dive into Robinson's early crimes. And there are conflicting accounts as to when some of these occurred, but we're going to go over them and just try to put them in the best order that we've been able to discern. These occur from the late 60s up into the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And to put that into perspective, it's basically the entire time that he was married and his children's entire lives. So 
week Golly. out of the year there. Yeah. During all of this turmoil, Robinson presented as the all-American husband and father. He was coaching baseball. He became a scoutmaster. He was a Sunday school teacher. He did everything that he could to just blend in and be that, like, you know, typical family man. As his family began to grow initially, Robinson grew desperate for money. And that's one trend in all of his crimes. He would do just about anything for money, even dupe one of his own brothers. Y'all are not ready. <laughs> not even a little bit. No, not no, no, even no. ready for this. Uh, the pressure of starting a family quickly began to build and Robinson decided to start stealing from his employer. The exact de details aren't known, but he was caught when confronted. Or, and when confronted, he begged and pleaded. <laughs> I guess he would be caught when confronted, yeah. Yeah, he he was like, am I being confronted or caught? I'm not, I don't know which one this is. It's like Amber Heard. I I use, um, spon donate and, what was it, sponsor, what was it, donate, donate and. Donate and, um, promised or something, like donated and, and promised. Synonymous. Something like that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And. Johnny Depp's lawyer was like, well, nobody else does, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're right. He was caught. And <laughs> when confronted, he was just begging and pleading for another chance. So his employer decided not to press charges, but he was fired. And that's when, that's when he realized that in a given situation, he could just talk his way out of trouble. This pisses me off so much. And, uh, okay, I'm not mad. I don't know who I'm mad at. I'm mad at John Robinson. That's for damn sure I'm mad at him. And nothing will ever make me not be mad at him. But I'm also mad that people, well, but who, who knows? We've talked so many times about certain uh, killers that they slip through the cracks every time. So let's say he did get charged. They would have been like, hey, but don't do that. And then he'd yeah. be like, all right, I'm just going to go back out and do it again. Like, it's just frustrating because it's like he got chance after chance after chance. And one would think I would do this probably. You get caught, you get busted, you get whatever. It's not fun. Nobody likes it. It's embarrassing. All the things. I'd be like, I better be on my best behavior now. Not right. Trying. Yeah. Like, I could have gone to jail and thankfully I didn't. Yeah. But no, not not John. And that, like, there's that fundamental difference, right, between, like, and I don't know, I'm not a clinical psychologist or anything, really? so, like, no. You play one on TV. Not yet, yeah. Um, And I know pe some people use, like, sociopath and psychopath, like, they overuse them and stuff like that, but this is one of those kind of traits, right, where, like, most people, when they get caught doing something like this, are going to feel embarrassed or shame or guilt or something like that. And they will then be thankful that they didn't go to jail and like, okay, look at that as another chance or whatever. Not John Robinson. He looked at that as, okay, well, I got caught, so I need to do better and not get caught. Not do better and do the right thing. I just need to do a better job at hiding it. But also, if I get caught again... It's really not that big of a deal. I can just talk my way out of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about the talking their way out of it situation, but Israel Keys very much took that. It's it's common with um with the old serial killers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's that's such a big part of that um like the profile of a serial killer. They don't feel that shame or embarrassment or guilt or whatever if they get caught doing something. They just learn how to work around it and keep going basically i feel like that like meme disgusting like I can't. it's just <laughs> yeah which one of yes and the <laughs> so after being caught in chicago the family moved to kansas city for a fresh start once there robinson used his totally real and accurate medical uh, certifications and employment background to land two jobs that does not sound like, uh, doesn't sound like Robinson to me. It does not sound like John Robinson, no. So the first was at Children's Mercy Hospital. The second was at Truman Medical Center. He told them that in the past, he was a technologist in medical labs, nuclear medicine, and in the radiography fields. Fields. He, in fact, though, 
had big fat zero experience in either or any of those fields. Just goose egg. Yeah, bupkis. If you're going to lie like that, I guess go big or go home. I don't know. It's like you could have just said one of those. That would be enough of a lie. But to be like, I am the queen of everything. Mm -hmm. I know. Name it. I know it. Done it. Right. Well, and also like you're you're not you're not you shouldn't lie about that stuff anyway, but you're not lying about that in like a newspaper interview to make yourself sound better, right? He's lying about having very specific qualifications and work experience to get a job where then he has to use those qualifications and work experience to do his job. And more times than not, I think it's going to be kind of obvious that first day you're like, did you see John back there? That was embarrassing. I need to, he doesn't know what he's doing here. Right? Yeah. Cause you like walk up there and you're like, <laughs> what does this button do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I, I don't know. Now he did smooth talk with his coworkers and kind of convince them that he knew what the hell he was doing at first. And at first, everybody liked him. You know, they seemed to get along with him really well. Again, he is very charming and charismatic. But after they saw him working, it was so obvious that he was full of sh He had no idea what he was doing. When he had to x-ray children, he was super clumsy. He didn't know how to handle them in general. I mean, think about any time you've been for an x-ray. You have to stand certain ways to get certain pictures. Maybe they gotta go still. in between. You've gotta, yeah, you've gotta be very still. So, like, they've gotta know okay, you're going to turn this way or you're going to turn that way. I know in some x-rays I've had to stand like close to the thing and sometimes you stand not backed up against it and like, you know, like you have to know that stuff. And he didn't know anything about it. He couldn't get them into those positions for the x-rays. Sometimes he couldn't even take the x-rays because he just did not know how. You know, you got to remember there was no YouTube, there was no Vines. And that's the whole job. Exactly. That's your hold. You had one job. And then when the pictures came back, co-workers noted that he couldn't even read the damn things. And all of those things he would have learned in school, which he went for a little bit. So he probably went long enough to get like some of the basics down, but then he quit. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know. In the beginning, they kind of chalked it up to just like, you know what? He's moved from a new city. This is a new job. Like, that's got to be um, intimidating. Like, maybe he's just, like, got the, like, jitters of, like, big changes, you know? Um, and he did whatever he could to put people at ease. In the office, he had framed forged credentials all over his walls, along with framed awards and citations. <laughs> and, you know, these people that he works with, it's like they're seeing this firsthand. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he has all these things framed around his office. Like, look at all the certifications I have and look at all the training that I've done. And so they, pr they had to be sitting there being like, am I crazy? Like, what is going on? I swear does he, he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, how does he not know how to do anything? But how has he won awards in this? Like, maybe I'm doing it wrong, you know? Like, Ugh, it's just a, and why would you not, you shouldn't, normally you don't have a reason to not believe somebody that brings that stuff in, right? Right. Like, you're not going to go call the school or whatever and be like, did he really, you know, I mean, if you're hiring this person, you should, you check their references or whatever, but he's already been hired. And so like, just as colleagues, they're just like, well, I'm not gonna yeah, they're probably dig really around. awkward at the Christmas party for you to be like. I don't think he knows what the hell he's doing. And then, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just don't really have a reason to not believe somebody. So, I don't know. It's just crazy. After a little while, he began to rub all of his coworkers the wrong way, though. And not only because of how shitty he was at his job. No, no, that's not the only reason. He also developed a reputation as the guy who constantly asked out his female coworkers and then tried to convince them to have affairs with him. I don't know if anybody needs to hear this, but I'll say it. Don't be that guy. Nobody likes that guy. Don't be that guy. Nope. No. And this was like all the time. It's not like, and this isn't right, but it's not like he met one coworker that he just, for whatever reason, fell head over heels for and was like, I really am super into you. 
No, no. This was every female he came into contact with. All the time. (sighs) And when they would rebuff his advances, he started going to different local nightclubs where he started to quench his thirst for extramarital affairs, and he was able to satisfy his his desire to enter into the BDSM lifestyle. It didn't take long for Robinson to be fired from both jobs at the trauma center and the children's hospital due to gross incompetence and his extracurricular activities, which were also raised as an issue at both hospitals. I mean, you're not going to be able to do that like you're getting paid to do it and somebody not report you. I mean, it's just, it's awful. Most people who found themselves in the situation, again, would probably have taken this as a sign and said, okay, I'm in over my head here. Like, I've got to quit this. I got to get a job that I can actually perform. I can't lie about my credentials anymore. I can't hit on women like I'm getting paid to, right? But all this did for Robinson was reinforce his thinking that he could just say whatever he wanted as long as he had some kind of a document or way to prove it on the surface because he knew most people will just take him at face value, right? Whatever he says, and they're just not going to look any deeper into it. Robinson soon smooth talked his way into a position with Fountain Plaza X-Ray. It was a new business that had opened in Kansas City that was started by Dr. Wallace Graham. And Graham was a well-respected physician who actually served as the personal doctor for President Harry Truman. This man is somehow so well-connected. I mean, I know it was like a chance meeting that he ran into Judy Garland. And I'm sure they didn't keep in touch after that or anything like that. But it's just like, you're working for... A president's personal doctor? That's a pretty big connection to have. Yeah. Dr. Graham was known to be a brilliant doctor, but he was also super kind, super trusting, and unfortunately a little naive regarding some people's true nature or intentions. So Robinson is at Fountain Plaza. They don't call the other hospitals for references, because why would you? I don't like that. I think that's bad. Yeah, yeah. We, like, always check references. Just do. It's just a good idea. It's just, yeah. And they were, they didn't check his references because they see all these credentials and they're like, wow, he is super qualified, you know? And of course, they're not going to think that these are forged credentials. Because most people don't do that. Exactly. While working for Dr. Graham, Robinson would proposition female patients that came in. He would also, though, try to have sex with patients and coworkers alike. So now he's even crossing another line. Both are lines you shouldn't cross, but now he's starting to do this with patients too. As if that's not enough. On top of all this, he starts embezzling from Dr. Graham. And just a quick note on stealing versus embezzlement. Stealing is generally classified and applied to any dollar amount or item that's taken. Embezzlement is typically much larger amounts, and this is the misappropriation of funds placed in one's trust or belonging to one's employer. So that's why you'll typically see then fraud and embezzlement go hand in hand, or you're gonna see somebody faking documents, um, forging signatures, things like that to perform the embezzlement. So Robinson forged checks with Dr. Graham's name, giving himself extra money when he needed it or just wanted it, honestly. In addition to that, on multiple occasions after performing an x-ray, he would tell the patients that they actually paid him directly in cash. Yeah, that's how we do it. You pay me (laughs) and then I'll handle your bill. That is so crazy. That is so crazy. He stole. it worked. It worked. It worked for him. He stole so much money from the doctor that when it came time for like the yearly Christmas bonuses, Dr. Graham couldn't give anybody the bonuses that they were supposed to have gotten. And estimates are that Robinson embezzled between $100,000 and $300,000 in the 80s. I just cannot. Like, so when confronted... Robinson tried to make an excuse and talk his way out. He tried to tell Dr. Graham, actually, no, it's not. None of the money is missing. I was just moving some stuff around um, as one does. It's all there. It's just not in the place that you were looking for it. So you don't know what you're talking about. It's just so bold. I know. To Again, to like look somebody in the eye and be like, no, it's not. No, I didn't. No, you don't. Like, no, I can see that money is missing. No, no, you're wrong about that. Like, but Dr. Graham was like, I don't even think so. So he called the police. 
And Robinson was found guilty of stealing by means of deceit, and he was given three years probation. For all of that money, he got probation. Probation. Wow. Again, most people would be like, okay, I've gotten caught doing some shady about nine times now. Somehow, I have evaded any jail time. Yeah, I've gotten a stern talking to and a slap on the wrist. What a miracle. I need to lock it up now. It's time to lock it up. But not John Robinson. So while he was on probation, he went back to Chicago, unbeknownst to his probation officer, and he gets a job as an insurance salesman. And then he was again caught embezzling funds. And he was ordered to go back to Kansas City where his probation was extended because it worked so well for him the first time. Right. As a deterrent that yeah. he, let's just extend it a little bit longer. Oh, that wasn't, the probation wasn't the problem. It just wasn't l- enough of it. Yeah, exactly. So in 1975, he was arrested again and his probation was extended again. And this time he was charged with securities fraud and mail fraud. Those are big charges. He's like the Teflon con man. For sure. Securities fraud is typically defined as stock or investment fraud. This arrest centered around a fake medical consulting company that Robinson had formed and took investments for. He also forged letters and documents from well-known businesses in the area and represented himself as a person who could take investments from people on behalf of companies. And one man invested as much as $2,500. The businesses caught wind of this scheme. He gets arrested again. His probation is extended. How many times do we have to embezzle, run Ponzi schemes, like whatever, and people just be like, well, he probably didn't mean to, though. Let's give him another chance. And then they give him another chance and another chance and another chance. He's still doing it. Like, he doesn't care. And the answer to that, how many times? The answer to that is a lot like um, Pirates of the Caribbean, at least... Once more, Miss Swan, when she's like, how many times have I call- told you to call me Elizabeth? And he's like, or how many times do I have to tell you? And he's like, as always, at least once more. Like, that's, there you go. Yep. that's that. At least once more. Exactly. So the pattern at this point is clear. He would get a job or start a business. He would steal money. He'd get caught. They would extend his probation, rinse and repeat. So again, he is just looking at this as what are they going to do? Give me probation? I don't give a you know, they're not going to arrest me. Why change? We're not gonna, I'm not going to go to jail. I might get arrested, but I'll just, you know. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I won't go to jail. Exactly. Um, I think if we're going to do this podcast, you should know the difference between being arrested and being in jail. I use them synonymously. <laughs> so that's just pledge, what I do. Pledge and donate. It was pledge, pledge and, and donate. donate. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I kept saying promise, but that's not right. Yeah. Well, that's pledge is a promise, so. That's true. Yeah. By 1979, Robinson had finally completed his extended, 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 extended probation. His probation officer said that he hoped Robinson would, quote, continue to reap the rewards of good citizenship. That's in 1979. (laughs) In 1980, he promptly got arrested again for multiple charges, including embezzlement and check forgery. This time, he served 60 days in jail. Too much. Not enough. Big whoop. Yeah. His victims ranged from a school teacher to friends that had known him for years. After his release from jail, he formed a fake hydroponics business and convinced a friend to invest $25,000. Now, he promised a really fast return on this. And this man desperately needed a fast return on this. His wife was dying from cancer, and so he thought this investment was going to return enough profit that they could actually get out of the medical debt that they had gotten into because of her treatments. So then Robinson got a job at Guy's Foods, where he reportedly was fired once they discovered that he'd stolen around $50,000. Oh, and had an affair with the secretary. God, so, he was busy. Very I don't. Busy. I don't understand it. He's he's worse than Lou Pearlman. Yes. Oh yeah, for sure. 
So he was fired, he was sued, he spent another 60 days in jail, and he had to pay back $41,000 of the 50 that he stole. Why? This, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know why, the, not the whole... Yeah, yeah. stole it. Exactly. The secretary also told his wife everything about their affair. And whether Nancy already knew of John's infidelity or just did not care... She really pulled out her best Tammy Wynette impression, and she stood by her man for decades. Good song, but bad. I I think that that's bad for Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not fun for Nancy. Um, and in fact, it would be almost five years after he was finally sent to prison before she actually did file for divorce. As if all of that is not bad enough. At one point, John Robinson convinced a local Kansas City charitable organization. <laughs> to name him to their board of directors. Okay, again, y'all are not ready. <laughs> so. This guy's good, a real pro. They name him to the board of directors, and then he took that opportunity to forge letters from its executive director to the mayor of Kansas City. He was also forging letters from the mayor to local civic leaders, commending himself for his volunteer efforts and just overall, like, what a great guy. Look at all the great things that he's doing. He's amazing. Like, he's so amazing that I, as the mayor, felt like I needed to write a letter about him to you. He then organized an awards banquet and told everybody who came that some anonymous person is going to get a Man of the Year award. How pathetic. <laughs> like... You made all of this up, and then you throw yourself your own party where you're like, <laughs> yeah. come, come celebrate with me, the man of the year. Exactly, like, where somebody will be named, we don't know who, and then, And then yeah. he's like, oh, oh, me? Oh my oh, god. Oh, me? Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, John Robinson gets <laughs> no, the award. <laughs> um, so, just to recap. John Robinson organized and gave John Robinson the Man of the Year Award. I didn't know we could do that, so good to know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the people whose names Robinson forged on the letters, they read about the award banquet in the paper. Because, again, he, okay, he created an awards banquet for himself. He nominated himself and chose the winner of himself <laughs> to win said award that was not real. But then he took it a step further and contacted the media so that they would put it out there so that everybody would know about it. Well, guess who else hears about it? The businesses that you forged letters from that supposedly voted you for this thing. And so they're like, we did not have anything to do with that. That was not us. So he ends up being exposed as a fraud again. But again, he's not embarrassed. That's, I'm embarrassed for, secondhand embarrassment is real. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's honestly, it's like beyond comprehension at this point. It just doesn't make any sense. What does the man of the year award even matter? Is it to help other people if they're like, wow, he was, that guy was man of the year. I'm going to give him low truckloads of money. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Now, I, I like to, I like for people to like me. I don't think there's a person in the world that doesn't, unless you're the Grinch, maybe, you know. But um, although the ranch later, he did want people to like him, and that's important. But that's um, I just also don't think that, like, who goes that far? Like, who goes that far? That's so crazy. It is. It's really like, Completely bizarre is what it is. Mm -hmm. So everything we've gone over so far has basically been a summary of Robinson's like more white collar crimes. Now in part two, which if you're a patron, you'll get that right now. Yeah. So you head on over. Welcome. Yeah. We'll take a look at the crimes that led him to ultimately being called the Internet's first serial killer. If you are not a patron, no worries. You will get that next week for free. 
like we do. We release one free episode every single week, so you'll just wait a week for it. Um, but if you are a patron, you get it immediately. All tiers get it immediately. Um, and it's and ad-free. ad-free. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you want to check it out, you can go to patreon.com slash pod. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. We love you. Bye. Bye.